So what I'm going to do now is a post analysis of our detection day yesterday and I may have got something slightly wrong. Now normally I, when I use the meter coil, the meter coil has slightly different configurations to the double coil, the double frame coil. It's got slightly different configuration and I may have made a slight miscalculation on the settings. So what you're about to see is Notebook LM. It's the, the uh, Americans, the two Americans, the man and the woman talking to each other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the, one of the original clips that I've got and they're going to have them talking over the top. Now I know some people don't like Notebook LM but it does a very good job at telling people how to understand in layman's English exactly what went a bit fundamentally wrong. <laughs> but like I said, it's like Sean said, it's like having a brand new machine. You've got to learn it and uh, well hopefully next time we go out I'll have it just right. So following now is the uh, post analysis of where it went a bit wrong. Whoops. Welcome to the deep dive. We're the place you come to get those dense technical docs broken down, giving you the real know-how for the field. And today, uh, we're tackling something pretty specific. Very technical, actually. It's all about configuring high-end precision equipment. Yeah, we're diving into a real-world challenge somebody faced. Yeah. We're looking at the Lorenz DeepMax Z2 detector, specifically when it's paired up with that huge 2x2-meter double-loop coil. We got some info about this uh, surprising instability issue someone ran into recently out in the field. So, yeah, we're going to figure out why this top-tier gear suddenly wasn't playing nice. Right. The mission is pretty clear. We're doing a kind of a technical post-mortem here, trying to understand the operational complexities. And the hook, really, is the frustration that comes through in the sources. I mean, you've got this incredibly sophisticated machine, supposed to be the best, right? But then you take it out onto challenging ground, and bam, it's giving you erratic peaks, constant background chatter, just unpredictable noise all over the place. And that ground, yeah, that was a real test. Heavy clay, lots of iron, high magnetic content. I mean, this is exactly the kind of stuff these machines are supposedly built for. Mm -hmm. They should handle mineralization like this. But instead, the team was basically fighting their own detector. Yeah, one of the guys out there really nailed the feeling. He said it was uh, like using a brand new detector you've never used before. And that line, I think it really highlights something important for you listening. Mastering these complex, you know, modular tools like the Z2, it takes time. It takes careful setup and definitely hands-on hours out there. This instability, it wasn't a flaw in the machine itself, it seems. It was a settings mismatch. Absolutely. That's what we found. The detector wasn't broken. It was just, well, it was accidentally set up to sort of sabotage itself electronically. Okay, electronic self-sabotage. Let's unpack that. Phase one, mm -hmm. diagnosing what actually went wrong on that field run. The soil, okay, heavy clay, high iron, definitely tricky. But you're saying the real error wasn't the dirt. It was a specific mode they chose on the Z2. What was that critical setting mistake? They had the Z2 set to GND2 mode. And just to clarify, GND, that stands for ground balance mode. It's the uh, traditional setting you'd use to filter out soil minerals. Okay, wait a sec. That sounds completely backwards, doesn't it? If you're dealing with really mineralized, iron-heavy ground, wouldn't you want to use the ground balance mode? Why would a setting that's supposed to help in tough ground actually make things, well, worse? It sounds logical, I know. But with this specific coil, the double loop, it caused this massive overcompensation. That was the heart of the problem. The sources show that combination of the tough soil plus the wrong mode, it made the machine basically misread everything. Instead of getting stable, it started amplifying signals, treating that magnetic content like it was metal. And that's where all that constant background noise and those uh, wild, unpredictable spikes came from. So when you say constant chatter, what did that actually sound like for the operator? Was it just a low hum or something more jarring? Oh, the feedback said it was pretty chaotic. Not just, you know, a gentle background noise. It was loud, sharp spikes, unpredictable sort of wobbles in the signal whenever the coil went over even small patches of magnetic clay. Mm. The machine was just overloaded basically is trying to apply a fix that the coil itself was already doing right let's get into that failure mechanism then because this seems like the absolute key insight the z2 was applying a second layer of filtering exactly that double loop coil its whole design genius is that it already performs its own ground and noise cancellation internally yeah. electrically so by setting the z2 control box to gnd2 
the detector was adding this redundant extra layer of electronic ground filtering. It's kind of like, um, imagine putting on noise canceling headphones, but then also turning on another noise filter on your music player. The two systems just fought each other. This overlapping correction actually canceled out the coil's own built-in balancing system. Wow. So you effectively blinded the system by trying to help it see better. It wasn't filtering too little. It was filtering so much it just broke the original compensation method. That's it, precisely. And this accidental override, it essentially made the upper coil in that frame ineffective. So the detector was suddenly exposed to all the noise it was designed to ignore including background EMI, uh -huh. you know, electromagnetic interference from power lines, fences, whatever. If they just used the right mode, the Lorenz would have recognized, ah, I've got the double loop attached and used its proper differential capability. Okay, that sets us up perfectly for phase two then. Understanding how that double loop coil is actually built, we need to get inside this big two by two meter frame and see why it cancels ground signals by itself. This is where the really clever engineering comes in, right? This is absolutely the core of understanding the whole Z2 setup with this coil. That 2x2 two two meter frame, it's not just one giant loop of wire. It's wow. way more sophisticated. It's a differential system. It's designed to be uh, permanently compensated. Okay, so what's making up that differential system then? It's actually two separate coils, two loops inside that frame. And the really crucial part is they're wired in opposite phase to each other. Two loops, opposite phase. Okay, break that down. What does each one do? Well, the lower loop, that's kind of the main transmitter and receiver. It pushes the magnetic pulse down into the ground, and then it listens for the return signal from the soil, from any metal targets, everything. And the upper loop, what's its job? The upper loop acts like a, like a noise monitor, really. It sits a bit higher, obviously, and it picks up two main things. The signal coming from the ground, mineralization below it, naturally, and also any external electromagnetic interference, EMI, that's just floating around in the air. But, and this is the key, it picks these up in the reverse polarity compared to how the lower loop sees them. Ah, okay, now I see how this works. The Z2 detector itself is designed to listen to both loops at the same time. That's exactly right. The Lorenz electronics are designed to mathematically subtract the signal it gets from that upper loop from the signal it gets from the lower loop. And because the upper loop is picking up the ground noise and the EMI in that reverse polarity, when you subtract the two signals, they just cancel each other out. Perfectly. It's like noise canceling headphones, but for ground minerals and electrical interference. Precisely. It's a really elegant differential process. It nullifies the soil response, nullifies the external interference. So the only thing left over, the only thing that should register as a clear target is that clean signature from a metallic object down there that's actually interacting with the transmitted field. So this whole self-correcting system is hardwired into the coil itself before the signal even gets processed by the main Z2 control box. Which means, yeah, right. yeah, if you then tell the control box, hey, apply your internal ground filter, the GND mode, you're essentially messing up that clever subtraction process that's already happened. You've hit the nail right on the head. That dif differential circuitry, that opposite phase wiring, that's the essential feature that demands you use the specific operating mode designed for it. Yeah. Which is DEL mode. DEL for differential loop. By forcing it into GND mode, the operator totally unintentionally disabled the entire point of that sophisticated coil design. Okay, wow. We've got the clever coil engineering. We've got the failure mechanism pinpointed. Let's pivot now to phase three, the essential operating modes. Because the key takeaway here seems to be match the mode to the coil you're using, not just how bad you think the ground is. Absolutely. You have to tell the machine, look, I'm using a free compensated coil right now, so just rely on its internal balancing, mm -hmm. okay? And that instruction, that's DEL mode. Right, and the source material laid this out pretty clearly in a little table. It shows exactly how to match the coil to the mode so you don't make this a rather expensive mistake. So, for our big 2x2 two two meter double loop coil, what's the correct mode range? You absolutely must use either DL3 or DL4. DL3 is your go-to, your stable, reliable starting point for just about any searching. DL4, well, it's a bit less stable, pushes things a bit harder. You'd really only try that if the ground is exceptionally quiet, electronically speaking, and you're trying to squeeze out every last possible inch of depth. But honestly, most experienced operators seem to stick with DEL3 for consistent, reliable performance. That's a good distinction. Pushing depth always comes with a trade-off, maybe a bit more noise for to listen through. Okay, so when should someone use those GND modes? Because they obviously exist for a reason for other coils. Oh yeah, they're critical for the Lorenz's simpler coil types. If you're using a standard single-loop coil, or maybe the one-meter frame coil, 
Those coils don't have that internal differential balancing. They need the detector's electronics to step in and help cancel the ground signal. So for those, you correctly use GND2 or maybe GND3. And what about the really small coils, the ones for finding smaller stuff? Right. If you switch over to the smaller DD coils, like the 26 centimeter or 35 centimeter ones, which you typically use for, you know, discriminating smaller targets near the surface, maybe in trashy areas, those need the highest level of electronic help from the control box to deal with ground effects and give good discrimination. So for those, you actually crank it up to GND6. So yeah, the simple rule is, if the coil isn't a differential loop type, like the big 2x2, two two, then you do use a GND mode to balance the ground electronic. Okay, so what does this all boil down to for the next time the team, or maybe you listening, is setting up this powerful Z2 system with the big coil? Let's run through that quick setup checklist they provided. Phase four, these seem to be the four key parameters you got to lock in. Yeah, let's nail down those ideal settings for getting both stability and depth with that 2x2 two two meter double loop. Okay, first up, the mode. We've hammered this one home, I think. Well, mode has to be DEL3. That's your default, your starting point. Yeah. Only consider DEL4 if you're absolutely certain the ground is super quiet electronically and you really need that tiny extra bit of sensitivity. But start with three. Okay. Next, the AUTO setting. This one sounds like it could trip people up. AUTO. Set this firmly to zero. That means off. This is critical. With a huge coil like this moving slowly over large areas, you absolutely do not want the machine deciding to automatically retune its ground balance halfway through a search pass. That would just introduce instability. Keep it off. Got it. Auto, off. Then the filter setting. Filter. Set this to three. The sources suggest this is the sweet spot. It gives you a good balance between cutting down on EMI, electromagnetic interference, and maintaining a quick enough response speed to register targets properly. Go too high on the filter, you might slow the response too much and miss things. Go too low, you might let too much noise in. Filter 3 seems optimal. Filter 3, okay. And finally, sensitivity, SNS. SNS, set this to 5. For these really large coils, SCNS5 provides a very stable yet highly sensitive setting. It lets you cover ground effectively without cranking the sensitivity so high that you start introducing excessive background noise and instability. SCNS5 is, is the recommended balance. DLL3, Auto0, Filter3, Sensens5. Got it. Now, beyond just dialing in those numbers, the sources also mention some important procedural steps. What does the operator need to do before they even start sweeping? Right. First things first. You must zero the machine over clean ground before you start any search pass. Find a spot with no metal, no weird minerals, and hit the zero button. This gives the machine a neutral baseline. Then, given how massive that coil is, it's really vital to maintain a constant height above the ground as you sweep. Keep the coil level. Don't dip it or lift it unnecessarily. And crucially, with this kind of setup aimed at large, deep targets, don't get sidetracked digging every faint little blip. You need to focus, only flag the strong, steady, repeatable signals. Strong, steady, repeatable. And what about pinpointing? Did they suggest a method for that since the big coil isn't exactly precise? Yeah, the recommended workflow is when you get one of those strong, repeatable signals with a big coil, mark the spot clearly. Then come back later with a dedicated pinpointing detector, something like a MindLab CTX 3030 or maybe a Manticore. Use that smaller, more precise machine to locate the target exactly and recover it. That way, you avoid messing up your main large coil search pattern, trying to pinpoint with the giant frame. That makes sense. So let's reinforce that core summary then. The whole problem, all that noise and instability, it really just boiled down to accidentally overriding the coil's own function. Sounds like a potentially very expensive mistake to make in terms of lost time and frustration, but thankfully a relatively simple fix once you understand the principle. Exactly. DEL mode is the key. It unlocks the depth and stability the system was designed for because it lets the coil's internal differential circuitry do its job. G and D mode, when used with this coil, accidentally shuts down that internal balancing, letting all the noise and instability creep in. So the absolute rule has to be match the mode to the specific coil type you have connected, not just your perception of the soil conditions. This has been a really, really insightful technical deep dive. So that noise, those false signals that were plaguing that field run, was a direct result of using GND mode, which effectively canceled out the coil's built-in compensation loop. It wasn't, you know, basic user error in the sense of incompetence. It was just part of that steep learning curve you get with these professional, highly modular systems. And, you know, this brings up a bigger question, I think, that goes way beyond just metal detectors. Mm. Understanding the internal mechanism, the differential wiring, the opposite phases, it's not just some bit of technical trivia. Mm. It's actually the fundamental key to making a high-end, 
component-based system perform the way it's supposed to. Yeah, it makes you wonder. When we're dealing with any complex modular system, could be detection gear like this, could be sophisticated camera rigs, specialized scientific instruments, anything where you connect parts together. How often might we be uh, unknowingly letting one setting on the main control unit override or interfere with the intended critical function of a component we've attached? That's exactly the thought to leave people with. It's a system integration check. The next time you run into unexpected instability or just disappointing performance from a sophisticated tool made of multiple parts, Take a step back and really examine the interplay between the settings on the central unit and the function of the specific component attached. Sometimes, like we saw here, the simplest setting change, based on understanding how the parts should work together, can restore stability and unlock the performance you paid for. Absolutely brilliant point. Well, thank you for taking this deep dive with us and really demystifying that Lorenz Z2 configuration puzzle. Hopefully you listening can take this knowledge and apply it to your own gear and setups. We'll catch you on the next deep dive.